Hello there, welcome. This is the last episode on the Out One series. Um, the 13 hour Jack Provets epic. Um, so I finally finished the uh, Out One, the actual full length one. Uh, so I finally seen the episodes 7 and 8. And as hoped for, it did not provide any resolution whatsoever. Uh, delighted in the mysteries and it was more of a character than any great mystery being solved. It was all about pe people creating mysteries for themselves to keep themselves intrigued rather than there is a big mystery. So um, that's what I really enjoyed about it. It was like um, it's ultimately character work and mystery and atmosphere rather than any sinister actual meaning. But like been well. When they wanted to have like atmosphere of dread, they, this film could really pull off. There's a conversation in episode 8 between a character who was called Pauline, but also could be called Emile, who had two different names, and Sarah, who was like the, the author. And Sarah's interrogating about her actions, and uh, it's really pretty sinister. It takes about 10 minutes, and there's a real sense of dread there, there's something bad going to happen. Nothing does, but there's a sense of dread to it that's really wonderful and it rings me a lot of well. So there's a sense in this that there's a lot of people try to ha uh, do things to get out of the way of their own lives, how to support their lives have become. There's a sense of play, there's also a sense of things that may have happened and may have felt serious, may not be. There's well, something I described in episode uh, 6 where I felt someone had been killed. At this point you're like, did that happen? Because it's never mentioned again, it's never brought up and the conspiracy you saw um, suggests something that's play rather than actual reality. There's another bit later on where someone seems to get shot and then you put the, the blood looks fake and it's like I don't think this, this does not look real at all, this is, looks like a, people are knowingly playing along and then you think back to the person being hit, he's like, did they really get hit or was it something else? Or was it um, just a play hit and everyone was acting along? I don't know. Like, I really don't know. And that's what's great about it. You don't know if what you were seeing was real or what, if it was a play. If it was people playing along with <laughs> something. Or it could have been they were, they, someone to one of the characters in the pen story went into something more serious than the rest of them and no one knew. You can't tell. <laughs> I mean, it's like, and they don't spend a ton of time trying to bring together all these weird stories and trying to make sense of everything. It's like, it's left to imagination. A lot of it is like left to being, what do you make of this? So I'll try and go through the stories again, like I've been doing before, so that we can get an idea of who everyone is and what we're up to in these final two parts. This Seven of Thebes story is pretty much abandoned by this point. The only people you really see is Quentin and Lily, as well as uh, Renard, who appears in another story, which we'll get to later. Uh, Lily has gone to this place, the Obeyed, which is this house that he saw Sarah, who run other people from the group, and in the earlier on in the story. Now she's gone there to recover from what happened from the apparent murder of someone. I don't know if it was a murder or not, if it was a play or not, if it was a... I don't really know. <laughs> I'm assuming that they died, but I don't... I don't know if it was meant to die seriously, but... But she goes there, she's uh, trying to say what to do, but it seems much more like she's trying to say what she's doing, but her theatre career is if to say she's not quite sure where to go from... go next, because it wasn't just the money was stolen, it was almost like her... Um, play was funny bits even before that so it wasn't obviously her way of doing things hadn't worked as she's um, doing that um, Pauline shows up it's also Emil um, Pauline is in the run from the same thing same event where she seems to have hit someone and killed him and she seems very upset about it's a guy called Pierre, who seemed to be the person who ran the group years ago, who runs the 13, who's pretty manipulative and got a lot of loyalty from the other people involved. But he's trying to uh, get her, he's like, um, 
She's annoyed us so much because she can't find her husband, Igor. Igor seems to be um, the thing for her. She thinks Igor may have been killed by Pierre. She's getting paranoid about it because Igor feels like he's up to some no good. Which again ties to the, the guy getting killed. It could have been real, for all you know. Um, so there's that element. Um, and during this time, Pauline is. She tries to release this information about Pierre's taxis to the papers. I guess stop everybody around her because they think that's not a good idea. Um, and then she ended up coming around to the idea that maybe it wasn't a guy to try and screw with Pierre and mess him about and get the law into him. But everyone's now looking at her as if she's a time bomb ready to go off. And she's done obsessed with a guy, Colin, who was investigating the whole thing, the th idea of 13. She's obsessing him beyond even thinking about children. And as Hilo will point out, she's really obsessed about Igor, and some people think she doesn't want to see him again, some people think she does, she's desperate for him. And it's like this weird obsession, she can't even see which way he's up and which way he's down anymore. She's completely... starting 40 bits. She's just... She, and it shows you the cruelty of this group is that a lot of people in that group know where Igor is, but no one's telling her because they think it'll make matters worse. We never find out where he is, and that's what gives the sinister side of this group the idea that yeah, there's some funny games involved, but there's some serious consequences as well. Like there may be some sinister elements to this as well that you don't know. And you can't quite put your finger on what what the actual plan is ever anyway. So it creates this unease that's floating through the, all these people and all the interactions. Like some people know more than others. And what happens to Pauline, it becomes this idea that she she has been treated pretty badly. They, they have been cruel to her. Her husband does disappear for six months that the year never contacts her and it's obviously getting to her. At the end of this, we have to put her talk to her and things and uh, she seems to have calmed down. But she's actually under the impression that Igor doesn't go to foreign lands. He just goes to this house for six months and hides in there to get away from her. Which may or not, may not be true. They never explain is she being paranoid or is it actually the truth? But it's also Igor seems to be tied to Pierre in lots of ways that may not be good for anybody. And I, Igor's, um, and Pierre seems to be tied to Lily and Pauline and interestingly it was never explained either. And it's like, you, need, you never get a grasp of that. And it's quite good you never get a grasp, but you can still try and figure it yourself because it's not clear. And it's not meant to be clear. So that's what was really interesting. Eventually Agra calls her and says he's in uh, he's in Paris, I she ends up going back to Paris, and that seems to be that part of it solved. But he's gonna disappear again and it's gonna keep going, it's always gonna be this thing that's always gonna be a problem. And no one's faced up to that yet. And so it's one of those things that's left to hang there as if it's a bomb that's gonna go off after the film has finished, you know. This is not going to end well, <laughs> but well, that's my interpretation. You interpret it as a, a continuous of a game, but obviously this story shows the cruelty of the game. The game is cruel to certain people. We, we go to Thomas now and his group. His group also have fallen apart. Um, one of the girl, one of the women, has left. Leaves the group because her lover is leaving Paris for a job. And even though she turned him down to start, but she changed her mind and goes, I didn't go with him. Then uh, also Sarah, who was friend to the group to try and tell them what, what the problem were with Prometheus. Uh, she argues with the group and she's a completely different view of art and thinks that they, they're doing stuff for, for a purpose. And it's, so she walks out and with these two leaving, the group has no purpose anymore. They've just lost a sense of purpose. And they just split up. Thomas ends up going to, because of the whole thing, the letters, Pierre's letters that Pauline's going to send to the press, he goes to try and deal with Pauline as well. But he's got ulterior motives as well. He doesn't even deal with Pauline. Like, um, Sarah goes there and she deals with him, deals with her. He ends up dealing with Lily, who it turns out he used to collaborate with her. They used to collaborate in plays, they split up six months ago, and 
and they're not doing very well for each other. You know, like they're both doing uh, the same place in the same right that fell apart. They're both trying different things and it's not working. Like they seem to need what the other person has, but the work there drives them nuts. So it's like they don't want to work with you. She doesn't want to work with him, he wants to work with her because he, he knows he needs her. So she suggests them they actually do a original play rather than a. They better play themselves rather than try to do an adaptation. So he agrees to that. So slowly but surely their t relationship starts to come together. But even then, there's a suggestion that Thomas isn't the nicest guy. So he ends up because he gets some people from his troop to take him to the Obeyed house to meet up with Lily and Pauline. And he ends up. He just doesn't mind fucking with these people who have been nice to him and who are part of his troop. Like suggesting he's having a heart attack, he's not. And he starts laughing uncontrollably. And you can see he's pretty desperate. They end up walking away from him. And this is towards the end. This is pretty much at the end of the. About one. And it's a suggestion that he's always going to alienate anybody who gets too close to him. He's always. He always acts nice and acts like he's a nice guy. But there's something in him that's not nice. And. If anyone who sticks with him too long ends up seeing it and seeing the manipulations. And. There's. There's elements. Uh, when you're watching him direct the play before everything falls apart. For the first because Quentin goes to their group after his group falls apart. Um, Thomas doesn't need to direct a play anymore, he just uh, can or he doesn't need to be acting a play, he can just direct it. And he's much more direct than everybody. And he's more manipulative and you just see his nature come out a bit more and it's it's much more like a case of why would you work with this guy? He's, there's obviously some statistic stuff going on on this character that's obviously makes him prime person for the group to go into this group of people who might be up to no good. So it ties him into them showing no what he's about. But also suggests no one should ever get too close to this guy, that there's there's damage with him. He's really not a nice person. And it's been that's been building throughout the whole of out, but by the end of the out it's like he's a person who Seems to be the life of the party, seems to be nice and seems to be encourage others, but he's always going to try and manipulate them to get his own way. And he's there's something even more damaging about him and more manipulative about him than there is for anyone else. On to the other stories, um, Federica, she um, ends up meeting up with Renard, who stole the money. Turns out Renard uh, didn't get the money, he ended up giving to his group of people who have also this other little conspiracy. So he's reading these conspiracy theories to try and speak sense about his life. And it, and it starts to see that Frederica has now become obsessed with the conspiracy theories. Like, that's what's given her life meaning. Rather than sitting depressed in a room trying to do a little short call, and she's now becoming more obsessed by these groups, these conspiracies. That gives her joy and gives her a meaning in her life. So she ends up hooking up with Renard and they seem to be almost like they're flirting by being members of the opposite of different groups trying to get each other. And that's their way of flirting and way of uh, connecting. Because they hook up together, do a blood oath to say they're married and then they're um, then the next time they meet they're throwing guns aimed at each other and he apparently shoots her but the blood's all... It's not realistic looking blood so it's... And the guns I've got look, don't look like they could kill anybody. And they don't look fake, but they don't look real either. It's like that's a weird thing. They look just a bit like there's a, it's a game going on. So at the end, he takes, he takes her disguise off and sees it's her. But, but you know, he really knows it's her. And the whole thing's a game, and she's got this blood on her, but as if it's not real blood. But you stay with her, and you, did, you don't establish that she's still alive. It's just one of those things that's just left to hang there. It's still part of the game, the damage of the game, and the joy of the game, and where it's going. So that's wonderful, because this point, Frederick has joined Pierre's group, and the group of people she stole the letters from, she seems to have made a contact with one, one of them, them called Lucy and who originally was the one who was brutal to her which given to try to sell the letters back to her and now she's like the contact to the group so it's like um, she's almost become one of them so that's what's wonderful about it is there's a kind of joy to and there's freedom to that and um, 
And there's a sense that there's some of these younger people who are interested in the groups like Renard and, and um, Frédéric and um, Colin, they're almost like, you also feel that those are kind of what these people who are older were when they were younger. Like, they did this stupid stuff to get me into their lives and now they've grown up a bit. They don't need it anymore, but they kind of miss it. And it's almost like um, the ones that are investigating them are actually investigating in, into the game itself to find some meaning. So Colin, the last one to cover, he's the one, he's like, um, just as Pauline seems to have fallen for him in some way, but in a way that you don't feel entirely genuine, he seems to have fallen from her in some way and shows he's love sick. And he's a very nice scene with um, Sarah, who really talks about his feelings for her and how much he misses her. And but she can see that he's almost like a child, and it's, she's like the Pauline's kind of like the princess form on her fairy story, and they actually use princess language and things. And she's saying she's not quite who you think she is, and there's part of her conversation with him that's the best with the sound, so you can't even understand what she's saying. And there's a wonderful sense that this is a obsession for him. He's obsessed with the games, so he hooks up with this guy Wozak, who's another member of the group, who is the one that, that a lot of people talk to because he's one of the most intellectual ones. And he's talking to Wozak, and he's saying that. He's trying to explain his idea of the 13, and then later on in the story he comes back to see him and says, no, the 13 were garbage, that was just a immature fantasy, I'm beyond that now. And then you see Colin going back to where he started in the story, where he's acting if he's deaf and dumb, and he's like giving people notes and things. And it's almost like that's where he's going again to get his instructions. It's like obviously he's going back to get to get to the next game, next level of the game. It's obviously he's been getting instructions for a while. That's what he's doing it for. So when you imagine the thought he was doing this for nothing, the first part of the story, now you think, no, he's doing this for a purpose. This is part of the game that might have been on for a time. So he's going back there, but he's wanting to go to the next level. It's not a 13 anymore, it's something else. And he's obsessed with the game as well. So he's trying to build himself into this group. And they've all started to recognise him and say, he's around everywhere, isn't he? And for a long time they thought he was uh, some from another group, and it turns out, no, he was from Pierre, who was the leader of the group who you never see. You don't see him or Igor. And Pierre had set him towards the group and to actually kind of bring them back to life and get them interested in games again, because obviously it's Pierre misses the friendships, he misses the people he's involved, he's involved with when he's younger, and he's trying to get them back into it. And some of them are annoyed by it, but other ones are really want to get back into it because they see there's something more there, there's something missing their lives. And there's also a sense that this guy may be very annoying, maybe a bit mad, but he has a purpose and he has a vision and maybe this 13, 13 even though it's ridiculous, there's something to it actually try to organise your life towards something greater than just living day to day. So while it's a game, it could become something worse. So there's a sinister element below the surface too, and someone like Colin or Friedrich, who's up, who are rev, or Friedrich, who are very on the margins of society, they could they could be like any person looking for meaning in any like terrorist group. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like uh, it's almost like looking at why people become terrorists or why people become mad and and to conspiracy theories. They're looking for it. So there's this guy, Pierre, who you never see, so you never have a chance to make an idea of who he actually is and what he's about. You see theories about him, so he becomes a conspiracy on his own. And obviously he's set Colin to get towards them, and he's interacting with them, and now a lot of them kind of like Colin as well, so obviously he's going to be part of the group in a weird way. Not quite in yet, but he's getting there. And as, as you see Wozak and this woman, Lucy, who... And she's the pop these these are two probably the most accomplished people. They one's a lawyer and one's he seems to be a professional and he's like they seem to be the most accomplished and the ones are the best best off. And it's obvious they kind of miss the life. Was that that well claim he doesn't, but he obviously does. And they're kind of wanting to get back in in a weird way. But it's almost they have to be seduced in by different methods. So that's what Out One's about. It's about conspiracy, it's about your 
own flaws and how they can be affected by conspiracy and how they can be how there's an actual inclination to conspiracy of things you don't know you'll create conspiracies for it even if it's not true or it's partially true like the whole thing of Paulie the bit um, did Pierre kill her husband no he didn't but he's probably behind whatever's causing a problem in her life which is her husband's always disappearing he's probably something to do with him there so it's part true part not true and everything here is part true part not true it's like the elements are true but it's been twisted by people's interpretations by manipulations by a part of a game that's never going to reveal itself and no one wants it to be fully revealed either it's like it's more fun if you try to try and work it out for yourself but you've also got all the damage to people's lives that goes on with it but no one se people seem to still be into it though I mean like um, you see Thomas is probably one of the lowest members of the group like originally you think he must be one of the highest members but at the end of it you think now he's probably the lowest he's the these are the dog who you say do things for them you know he's like the He's the pretentious one, so he can. Um, he seems more public, but he's to any of them. Once you start to hear him talk about him, he's like, "What did you do that for? That's stupid." You know, it's like, no, nah, he's not important. Sarah, who originally seemed to be one of the least important ones, living away from everyone, she's always the mother hen of the group. She's the one who goes and deals with people and is can be pretty brutal, pretty terrifying at times. And a lot of people are kind of scared of her, but she's very logical when she asks the questions of why are you doing this, what's this all about? But at least her actually being as a writer stuck a lot because she questions everything and she can't proceed with um, just instinct. Instinct's not good enough for her. It's like, what's the meaning of this? So she's, but she, it still makes her a good person that everyone kind of revolves around, but also means people are kind of a bit scared of her and have a bit of a terror of her. You know, so I mean, basically, basically Lucy's kind of the controller, she's the legal person, and everyone else in the room little space. These are obviously all friends from years ago, and the group was really, like, 13 was just a bunch of pretentious kids having fun. It wasn't anything serious, but Colin and other people had taken it seriously, or maybe they took it seriously when they were younger. But it doesn't really exist, but it exists in their brains, it exists as a romance in their brains, it's a literary illusion, it's... So it makes a wonderful the whole idea of, of what's conspiracy, what's not, and how does that affect humanity? Because it, it shows you how people can be this way. And you, and you see the way the world's going, people get caught up with conspiracies all the time. To the extent they're more interested in conspiracy than they are in the actual reality. It's more fun, the headlines more fun, the um, life is more fun when there's something to discover or something that's just been discovered rather than what does it mean? Because day to day life is what does it even mean? and what are the consequences and that's depressing and boring and as someone points out it's like you go through your life and realise it's just not a day and you've done nothing with it with this it, may, it gives an illusion of doing something with it even if you're not same way in life if you've there's an illusion of things are getting done in media or something when it's not it's just a progression of the same and same old but it's like an illusion that exists for people it makes their lives more interesting for them and this for these French these people in Paris and they're kind of middle class and well off, maybe higher middle class and they can afford to be uh, frivolous you know they're not going to be put in the street or anything they can afford this so it allows them to take chances and be a bit dangerous and maybe cause havoc and know the plot away with it so it becomes this thing it's this consequence but not that many consequences so out as a whole is wonderful, it's very mysterious, there's um, the actual theatre stuff that goes through it, this is, the, I'm going to talk about the general overall view of out rather than just these two episodes. The theatre aspect of it does tell a story but you have to be paying attention to it all very carefully. It's also ambiguous enough and everything, it's like I've said what my opinion of out is, out one is, you can watch and have a completely different opinion of this. It doesn't stop and tell you what you're meant to interpret it as. You're being interpreted as whatever you interpret it as. It's like a, it's just human beings and going through their lives. In the same way you interpret different things of different actions of people in your own way. You can do that with this as well because it doesn't stop and tell you what the film's about. You have to interpret it for yourself. And I think that's wonderful. So every story has a purpose. Like for me, some stories, the purpose of these 
people who you're wondering why they were doing it, you find out the prize, find some meaning. The younger ones and older ones who originally were mysterious, they're just, to me, they become people who are compromising, they are needing something back in their lives. There is a kind of fun structure to it where there is a kind of fairy tale, tale structure to it in a weird way that is never overstated, but the the idea of doing these plays creates the idea of myth and the idea of it kind of makes your viewing of the story be very focused, focused not just on intellectual elements but also on the, the, the story elements that pass through through time because you're getting them through interpreting how people move and how they direct through the showing of the plays which most of which are silent so that when you're watching the rest of it you're still in that mindset that not everything is about what they're saying, it's about how they're reacting and it's how they're looking. And it creates this atmosphere of the words matter, but also sometimes they don't matter, or maybe they're lying and you can interpret the line through the body language, which is what you get in most films anyway. Well, ideally, a lot of films you just get the everything makes the same thing. But because this uses a lot of non verbal storytelling, it creates the idea of myth floating through and the mythical constructs that inform your lives which can be different for different people because like, some of the Sarah takes a very intellectual element to it and something like Lily is much more emotional about it and, he, and these two things are always in a competition but also something that are going together as people have different interpretations of what things mean and what means mean what, what anything means to them and what overall meanings are You've got to interpret it yourself. That's what the film lets you do. It doesn't say this is what it means, this is what not mean. What it doesn't mean, it's like, it's a conspiracy theory, but it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a story of theatre, but it's also a story about life rather than just theatre. Theatre is just the metaphor that allows the story to be told. And it's wonderful, it's just wonderful. I'm not going to jump back into it and watch it straight away. I will watch Spectre at some point, but probably for not for a couple of months. To get a distance and see how it's cut down. I've got, I've got quite a lot of revet films still in the box set, so I'll be probably watching them over the next year, just watch them and see what they are and try and catch, pick up some of his other films. Because this is a great film to obsess over. Like, this is not going to be my only view of this film. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing it again, just not quite just now. But after having seen it all, I am interested in seeing it again to see how everything fits together in different ways. So that would be very interesting to watch, but it's wonderful, it's really worth seeing. I hope I've, this video is of interest to you, and I hope you've seen it already and watched the video we watch it again. And if you've watched it without seeing it, you've probably been spoiled <laughs> completely. But I don't expect this video to get many views, <laughs> so I'm doing it for me more than anything else. But I hope you watched, I hope you enjoyed it. And that's the end of the Out series for now. Right, goodbye.